sorry about that. Um, so, a car, this is again uh, 2008 paper, just for the sake of the recording, so we can reference in 2008, we starting with question five, we already finished the first four questions. A calf mass M, mass M shuts off its engine at the top of the hill and coasts downhill in the diagram. If frictional force opposes the motion is X, the acceleration of the car is given by it. So that's a question again. I wrote up the answer, but basically, if the car is coasting downhill, the frictional force F must be acting up. And what is acting down the slope? Can you tell me what is acting to pull the car down the slope? Everybody knows this. What is acting down the slope? What is acting G? down the slope? G? No, G is acting vertically. What is acting down the slope? Friction? No, friction is acting up the slope. Friction opposes motion. The car is moving downhill, so friction is always acting up the slope. What is acting down the slope is the component of the weight of the car. The weight of the car acts vertically, but part of that weight acts down the slope. It's called the component of the weight of the car. It acts down the slope. All right? We know this about uh, a plane, an inclined plane. I'll expand on that. Let me just reveal the answer to the question. So what I just described is, they tell us the car coasts downhill. So if the car is moving in this direction, there must be the frictional force acting to oppose. Friction cannot act in the direction of motion. Friction acts to oppose motion. Friction always acts to oppose motion if there is motion or any tendency to move. If an object is trying to slide in one direction, even though there is no actual motion, friction acts to oppose that tendency. To move. So that's what friction is. It opposes actual motion and it acts in a direction to oppose any tendency to move. So we have this frictional force because the car is moving down to this one is pretty straightforward. The other force I said is this component of the weight down the slope. Let me expand on this idea a little bit for the people who got, got a little stump there. If you have an inclined plane, if you have an inclined plane like this, and you place an object on this plane of mass m. We know that this object feels a pull of gravity, which is mg. This plane has an angle theta. And we also know that this weight is a force. And we learn that if you have a force, you can resolve force. You can break forces up and find components in different directions. In this case, there are two relevant directions. There's one direction coming down the slope. There's one component, one direction of, of relevance coming down the slope. That component or that part of mg pulls it down the slope. And there's another component of mg that acts perpendicular to the slope, that presses it into the slope. This component doesn't cause any motion. This component causes all the motion. And we said, that since this component is on the opposite side of theta, this is not the triangle here, the vector triangle, this is on the opposite side of the vector triangle, then this component is called mg sine theta. Again, if you're having trouble with this concept, this is something we've done, and we can review it if you wish, but if you're having trouble with the inclined plane, just tell me you want me to, you want me to do some work on the inclined plane and I'll build all of this back into your mind. But right now, just take it as the component down the slope. If the angle with the horizontal is theta, the component down the slope is mg sine theta. That's fine. So if the resultant force, what is the resultant force? Since it's moving down the slope, the resultant force will be mg sine theta minus f. f is act, acting up the slope. And that resultant force is what causes the ME, the acceleration. And from there, we simply solve and we get our answer to be D. Any problems going once? So, yes. Evelyn, you good? Yes, I'm good. Right. Next one. What is the gravitational field strength of a planet whose mass is one third that of the Earth and whose radius, whatever? Now, what is gravitational field strength? Gravitational field strength, common G, 
is defined as gravitational force per unit mass. Gravitational force is given by Newton's law, where F is equal to G M M over R squared. So this is the defining equation for what? Gravitational field strength. This is what gravitational field strength is, is the gravitational force per unit mass. And again, I've already written down some stuff for the question. F, according to Newton's law of gravitation, is equal to GMM over R squared. And I just, we know that F is equal to mg. So when you transpose, you get an expression for gravitational field strength. The m's will cancel out and you end up with GM over R squared. This is what the gravitational field strength looks like on Earth. All right, M is the mass of the Earth, R is the radius of the Earth. And this is also the general equation for gravitational field strength. The gravitational field strength for any planet, for any planet is G by the mass of that planet divided by the radius of that planet squared. That's a general equation, but it's also specific for the Earth if M is the mass of the Earth and R is the radius of the Earth. We're good. For this planet, for this planet they're talking about, they said the mass of the planet is one third that of Earth. So when we're replacing M in the general equation, we will write M over three. The mass of that planet is one third. We're trying to find G prime, the gravitational field strength for that planet. G, M over three. And they said that the radius is one half that of the Earth. So the radius, the denominator, we put R over two and we have to square that. So it's G, M over R squared still, but this is G prime for the next planet. And when you simplify the expression, you end up with this. And this part here, you can, you can factorize this out of the, the whole expression and replace this by G. And therefore we get that G prime, the gravitational field strength on the surface of that planet is four over three G, pretty simple. Questions going once. Going twice. Gone. Next one. A calf mass M moves around a circular road of radius R at constant speed V. Which of the following is true? Is the velocity the velocity changes in magnitude and direction and acceleration is constant? Do you agree with that? Does the velocity change in magnitude and direction? Mm, no. Doesn't the, ve the velocity change in magnitude and direction? So the magnitude doesn't stay constant, though? Yes, I agree to the velocity changing. Sorry, the velocity changes and the magnitude of the acceleration is constant, sorry. Yes, you are correct. I'm sorry, I read wrong. Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Silly, I just read it wrong, right? The velocity changes and the magnitude of the acceleration is constant. The size of the acceleration, the acceleration is always pointing towards the center, so its direction is changing. But the velocity of vector is changing as well. So this is true. Um, there's no resultant force, that's absolute rubbish. Once there's circular motion, there's a resultant force towards the center of the circle, that force is called the centripetal force. And this one is pure and utter rubbish. The resultant force on the car is outward. It's like, what the heck? All right, so we understand the answer is um, A. Got it? All right, we did this in the 2009. I also wrote it again for the 2008. This is the error question we did last week where we have the length and its uncertainty the mass of the cube and its uncertainty, and they are asking us to use the equation to determine the density and the percentage error. Determine the density of the cube, the percentage error. Um, what is the uncertainty? And we know that whenever we have an equation, this is a product quotient. And if you were to write this equation, and you write, the, this is how we write the error form. That delta rho over rho, is equal to delta M over M plus, because there's a power of three here, the power of three comes in front, just like when you're doing 
um, logs and so on. The power become a multiplying factor. Three delta L over L. Again, this is a standard way of processing this equation into the fractional. This is called the fractional error. This, this equation, last day I did the percentage error equation. Today I'm writing the, the one that we normally write, which is the, the fractional error equation. Liam outside, but Liam running and coming back. This is called the fractional error equation. So we can run the calculation, we can get the fractional error, the fractional error. The fractional error, delta rho over rho is 0.14. And therefore, the percentage error we know is the fractional error by 100, which gives us the 14%. Any questions? Nothing. Next question. For an object undergoing projectile motion, which best describe the vertical and horizontal velocity? We know that if we had to define projectile motion, projectile motion we can define it to be i hope i don't have any let me just view it right projectile motion i think i wrote it here hold on yeah projectile motion is where you have constant velocity in one direction with constant acceleration in the perpendicular direction that's what projectile motion is so when a body is projected let's let's go in tight here When an object is projected like this, it follows that, sh that characteristic path. This path, if you were to write the x, y equation for this path, that equation will be y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. It's a quadratic in x. If you were to re reference the, the y position and the x position. Now, when the body is projected, it's projected with some velocity in that direction. That velocity, can be broken up. Let me, in fact, let me just put in that velocity for us today. Um, this is the actual velocity of projection projected at some angle theta. All right. That's the actual velocity of projection. That velocity has a horizontal component, which we would call V, which will be V cos theta. And a vertical component that is equal to V sine theta, horizontal and vertical. The horizontal remains constant. This horizontal component does not change at every point. We know that. The vertical, however, because gravity, because the pull of gravity is acting down, because the pull of gravity is acting down, this acceleration works against the vertical and makes the vertical smaller, makes the vertical zero at the top here, and turns the vertical component around. So the vertical component is always changing, but the horizontal component is constant, does not change. So parabolic motion is motion in which there's constant horizontal velocity, but in the perpendicular direction, you have constant acceleration. And therefore, and therefore, from that, the horizontal must be constant. The horizontal must be constant. And the vertical cannot be constant. The vertical is, in fact, changing. So the answer is, the answer is B. All right, next one, an object floating in a fluid which statement is not true. And the answer is D. 
that's probably self-evident. If an object is floating, which, are, which is not true, the resultant force is zero, the resultant force is zero. That's what, what floating means. Floating means it's balance, it's an equilibrium. So the resultant force on any system that is in equilibrium must be zero. The weight of the object is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. That's called Archimedes' principle, which is true. The upthrust is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Archimedes' principle. All right? So therefore, the only possible nonsense answer is the upthrust is greater than the weight. If the upthrust was greater than the weight, it would not be floating, it would be rising. The upthrust, if the upward force on an object is greater than the downward force. That object could never be in equilibrium. That object will be accelerating upwards. So this is clearly the nonsense answer. Mm. Yes. Oh, just, just a quick question. If the object is equal to the weight of just left. So I'll ask you now. Uh, object is floating now fluid. If the object is equal to the weight of the fluid, would it end up um oh no no sorry fluid object I mix up so I tend to mix up things sorry that's no problem that top thrust is equal to the weight of the fluid displays that's Archimedes principle all right next one which of the fall which which of the statements below best describe the motion of a geostationary satellite The answer to this one is D, all right? It cannot move at the same velocity as the Earth because if you have the Earth here and the satellite outside here, the Earth would move from here to here in 12 hours, let's say 12 hours, but this satellite must move a much larger distance in the same 12 hours. So they cannot be moving at the same velocity, that's rubbish. The geographical location changes, well, that's geostationary means that it must remain fixed. It must remain fixed if it's geostationary. The acceleration is zero again. Once a body is moving in a circle, you cannot have zero acceleration. There must be a centripetal acceleration. So that's clearly not going to be possible as an answer. Number 12. Number 12 always gives trouble. What I did this time is I, I wrote two completely different ways solutions. I hope it doesn't confuse you too much. Um, but I put down two solutions for number 12. All right, first solution. They're telling us that there is a force of 40 Newton acting on the surface. The question tells us that. We also know that the distance from here to here is 1.5. Therefore, the distance from here to here is 0.75. Now, why did I put the force in the middle? Because if you have an object, if you have an object, and I tell you the weight of this object is 5 Newton, everybody will put the point of action of the weight right in the middle here and we will put five Newton here. Similarly, and, and, and it is because the weight is acting all over, all over, uniformly all over. In the same way, if you have a total force of 40 Newton acting over this entire broad surface, if you have a total force of 40 Newton, as the question says, acting on this surface, then you can represent the location of that force as if that force was concentrated and fixed in the middle, just like when we deal with weight. This is called center of mass, and this is called center of the force, same principle. So we can represent the entire weight of the wind as if it was acting smack in the middle here. Everybody clear on that concept? Excuse me, sir, Nicola, is any written? Yeah, just, I just left him, sorry. Thank you. So you can explain that again, please. Yeah. If you have an object, this object is made up of matter and matter and matter. All of these chunks of matter feels pull of gravity. 
But when we look at the mass of this entire object, we can represent the mass of the object as if the mass was concentrated at one point. That point is called the center of gravity. Right? In the same way, this wind is blowing and exerting forces all along this 1.5 meter surface. Yes. And therefore, we can represent this entire force. There are many, many forces, small force, big force, a whole range of forces acting just like they have a whole range of masses here. We can represent all of these forces by the wind along the surface by one, 40, and apply it right in the middle, just as this is smack in the middle. Yes. All right. So we have this force acting here, and this is our pivot right there. And we want to find the moment. Now we know we cannot simply multiply this distance by that force, why? Because they're not at 90 degrees. The moment of a force is the product of the force by the displacement, but the force and, and, and uh, the force and distance must be at 90 degrees. So I cannot simply multiply this. So you cannot just multiply 0.75 by 40. Everybody okay with that, right? The yes. two of them must be at 90 degrees. Now, I did a little drawing up here to show you what I need to do. This is the 0.75. This is the 40 Newton here. I can take this 40 Newton and break it up into two components. One component, this one here would be 40 cos 50. If you look at the right angle triangle here, this is 15 degrees. This component will be 40 sine 15. This component on, on the opposite side will be 40 sine 15. And the component on the, on the adjacent side will be 40 cos 15. Everybody okay with that? Sine and cos. All right. This component, which incidentally also resides I can move it across, actually. This component, which also is sitting right here, this component cannot provide, let me shorten this a little bit. This component cannot produce moments. This is the 40 Newton. The 40 can be replaced by this force and that force. This force cannot have a turning effect. This force can only elongate or stretch the door, but not um, push the door one way or the other direction. This is the force that actually makes the door rotate. So to find the moment of the force, we have to use this component. So the moment will be 0.75 by 40 cos 15, which works out to be 28.9, which works out to be 28.9 Newton. Any questions on this? Yes, sir. Everybody, everybody got any questions you want to ask? It's a little tricky concept here. We, we can't use this. We have to use the component of the 40. The component of the 40 acts here. We can break up the 40 and replace the 40 by these two forces. This one has no moments, cannot cause any rotation. This one causes the rotation. Again, we see that the two forces, this, the distance, this 0.75, the 0.75 is at 90 degrees. The moment of a force is the force by the perpendicular distance. Force by the distance that is perpendicular to the force. So we clear on that. The next way of doing the same question is, still resolving, still resolving, is where I take, we know the force is acting in this direction. So I take this, this distance and I represent it, I replace that distance by this. This is the effective area. This part I've drawn is the effective area of the door as the wind is hitting it, not the 1.5 meter. So we can use this effective distance and do the same math, where 
this effective distance is 1.5 cos 15, and therefore half of that distance will be 1.5 cos 15 over 2, and you multiply that by 40th, all done here, and you get the same answer. So those are two methods to do it. Any clarifications needed? Claire, next one. Um, again, this is pretty straightforward. If P is momentum of the object and M is mass, then the expression P squared over M has the same unit as. So again, we, we break up this into its units and we end up with this. Kilogram meter squared per second squared. That's when you do your can cancellations or whatever. The correct answer is energy. We know energy is equal to force by displacement. Force is mass by acceleration. And mass by acceleration is kilogram meter per second squared. Displacement has units of meter. And when you crunch that, you see that this and that is the same. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be energy. Number 14, the parachute, parachute is falling at terminal velocity. The resultant force acting downwards. Well, if the parachute is falling at terminal velocity, it means the velocity is constant, not so. Terminal velocity means constant velocity. And if you're moving at constant velocity, there's no acceleration. So there can be no resultant force. There can be no acceleration. This is the answer. The gravitational potential energy is being converted to heat in the surrounding air. This one is wrong because if the drag force was less than the weight of the parachute, it's like saying there's a drag force. And there is the weight of the parachute. If the drag force was smaller than the weight, then there would be a resultant force, and therefore there would be an acceleration. But since there is no acceleration, this cannot be possible. The resultant force, in fact, the drag force, in fact, must be exactly equal to the weight in order for terminal velocity to happen. Again, this Blue Mountain question, we did it in 2009. I'll just do it again in a different way. So this person has to climb 1,800 meters. So the total potential energy needed will be MGH, which works out to be 900 kilojoules. That's not a problem. You can run the math. Now, each energy bar, each energy bar has 1,000 kilojoules. But although it has a thousand kilojoule, you don't get a thousand kilojoule when you eat it. The useful energy, the amount of energy you could actually use that could be converted, they says a 10% efficiency. So if you have a, hundred, a thousand joule, how much of that becomes useful? 10%. And 10% of a thousand is a hundred joule. So every one of these bars you eat, you only get a hundred kilojoule of energy. And, but you need 900 kilojoules to climb the mountain. So clearly, if you're getting 100 per bar and you need 900, it's obvious that you need nine bars. The answer is B. That's pretty straightforward. Number 16, we get into module two. A pendulum is at the highest point when it's released. Once it is the highest, highest point, the initial velocity is going to be zero. We know that when a body is performing simple harmonic motion and it, it is at the extreme positions, two things. When the body is at the extreme positions, if you have a body performing simple harmonic motion, at this point, 
the velocity is equal to zero. But what can you say about the acceleration at this point? What is the acceleration when you pull it to the extreme end? So it's the highest? Maximum. That's right. Acceleration is maximum. The acceleration at the very end here is maximum, but velocity is zero. But this question is about velocity, so clearly um, the velocity must be zero. First point. So these two are possible answers, but we know that simple harmonic, the velocity function of simple harmonic is a sinusoidal function, not a, a ramp function, a sinusoidal function, and therefore our answer must be this. Um, we said if, if x is equal to x zero sine omega t, then v is equal to dx dt, and that will be equal to omega x zero cos omega t, all right? So it must, it's a sinusoidal function. It's a cosine function if x is x zero. This is when you start in the middle. If you start at the end, however, if you start at the end, which is this question, x is equal to x zero cos omega t, because at t equal to zero, x is maximum. And therefore, V would be equal to minus omega x zero sine omega t. All right, those kinds of transitions we can use to choose our answer. Number 17. Number 17 is pretty straightforward. It's just based on the defining equation. We know that the general equation for simple harmonic motion, I just wrote it, x is equal to x zero sine omega t. Omega we know is two pi f, and omega is two pi on t. Omega is any one of these things here. So when you look at the equation, they want us to find the frequency, so we'll be using this form of the equation. If they wanted to, sorry, no? 2 pi over 2, 2 pi over t, what am I writing? All right, so we want this form of the equation, which is x is equal to x zero, sine 2 pi f by t. And what we are seeing is 2 pi f by t is this. 0 0.4 pi t is equal to 2 pi f t. T's will cancel out, pi will cancel out, and therefore f would be equal to 0 0.4 over 2. 0 0.4 over 2, which is 0 0.2 hertz. And therefore that's our answer. Questions, please ask them, you know, I'll, I will explain. I, I just don't want to waste time since, um, since we have um, 45 questions. Uh, and we only read 17 in the first 20, in just about an hour. But no I will, questions, sir. Great. The phenomenon, next question. The phenomenon of damping is not useful in a pendulum clock. We use damping in the suspension of a car. If you don't have damping, when you drive over a bumpy road, your head will be slamming into the roof of the car. We use damping on the foundations of building to protect it against earthquakes. We use damping in suspension bridges so that it can be protected against uh, vibrations that could cause structural failure. The only place that damping is not useful is in a pendulum clock, because if you have damping in a pendulum clock, the clock will run slow and the clock would need to be chained or the battery replaced very often. So that's not a good thing. So Evelyn asked the question in your chat. What is damping? Damping is where um, energy of motion
So damping is where energy in an oscillation is converted to heat energy. All right? Yes, sir. That's all right? So um, damping is where what is converted to heat energy? Energy of oscillation. Oh. The energy that you put in to cause the oscillation, it's converted gradually to heat energy. So the amplitude, that's why you displace a simple pendulum after a few minutes, the pendulum amplitude gets smaller and smaller. Yeah. It's because oh. of this thing called damping. Thank you. All right. What is the phase difference between two points labeled A and B on the graph? All right. So we know the equation for phase. Uh, delta theta over theta is equal to, uh, uh, what is it? All of that. Delta theta over theta is equal to T over T. Or uh, if you want to put it in, in terms of radians, as this question is already in radians, I can put this in a radian form. Delta theta over 2 pi is all of that. Now, the physical distance from here to here, we're using this form of the equation because this gives, sorry, not distance, this gives us time. So we're using this form of the equation, all right? So delta theta is equal to t. What is the time differential from here to there? From here, sorry, from here to here, what's the time from here to here? From here to here is capital T, not so. One period. Everybody agrees? Yes, sir. That's one period. One complete cycle, one period. If I mark this point, the time from here to there, the time, that time would be t over 2, not so. And if this is another t over 2, then this time here clearly would be, clearly this little time here would be t over 4, not so. So basically t is 2, um, two pi? No, t is not 2 pi. That's not what, oh. So it's not one oscillation. We have the T well between A and this point here. Eh? Uh, I don't know which point you're talking about. So um yeah, so from there. Yeah. That from there to there, well the distance we have T is not um one oscillation. Uh uh, this is a time axis, so I don't know what you want to talk about one oscillation. This is time axis, so whatever distance we're referencing here is time. Oh. oh, okay. So from here to here is one complete oscillation, yes, but what time are we referencing is T, one period. Okay. From here okay. to here will be T over 2, from here to here will be T over 4. We good? Yes, sir. Right. Now, and therefore, this, the, the, the total time difference between these two points will be t, one and three quarters t. Do you agree? Yes. The total time from here to here, the total, you add up this to that, to that, the total time difference between a and b is one and three quarter t, or seven over 40. Oh, sorry. I should put a capital T here, not a common T. Everybody agrees with that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the time between, this is a general equation for finding phase difference. I'll do, it, I'll do this question about two different ways. I'm just doing the first one now. Today, a student asked me a question, more detailed question on this, where this question came in another year and they wanted a different answer. And I'll, I'll explain all of that. I'm just dealing with this one currently. And then I'll look at that one. All right. So this is the equation that allows us. This is an equation we need. We are supposed to know that will allow us to work out phase differences. 
We've done this equation. If you don't know it, you weren't in class when I did it, you memorize it. That's the equation that works out phase difference. Delta theta is the phase difference in degrees. T is the time difference between the two points or the two events, where capital T is the period, X is the physical distance. X is the physical distance, and we qualified this, didn't we? The physical distance along what? Anybody could complete that sentence for me? The physical distance along what? This is very important. When using this equation, it's very important to know that this X was the distance along a ray. I hope you remember the question we did where we, we, we spoke about the wave approaching a wall. The Cambridge question we did where we spoke about the wave approaching a wall and they wanted to find the phase difference along the wall. And we had gone through a solution. If, if you need some clarification on that question, make a note on it about the wave approaching the wall on phase. Send me a request tonight for that question. I will find it. It's in, your, it's in your notes. I will find it. I will write up the solution and send it back to everybody in the group chat. So if you want this clarification, just let me know and I will do so. But I'm not going to interrupt the class to clarify this. This is the equation. X is the distance along a ray and lambda is the wavelength of the wave. So we're substituting for T in the equation. Claire? Uh, what am I saying, T? 7 over 2 pi, not T. My bad. 7 over 2 pi. That's the answer. Let me just pull up the other question that I got. Same, same question. See it? Same question, but this time, you do not have the option of seven over T pi radians. See it? You do not have the seven over two pi radians, seven over two T pi radians. So how do we do this one? You will, screen, you will screenshot this one. Sorry, I will screenshot it and put it in the group chat to complete the answer to this question. Uh, what's happening? People getting bumped out, internet having issues. I've seen people in class and then they disappear and come back. Yes, yeah, sir. Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi can be a little trouble these days. I had a call off my class on Friday because Wi-Fi just shut me down. We had it. We had it yesterday. On um, yesterday. Yeah. So like you have flow. Ah. Huh? Using flow internet. If I have flow. Please in flow internet. Oh yeah, always the best internet there is is flow. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Well, I, I think if, if you all, I, I agree with you, Flo is not the best, please leave and go and join Digicel so I'll get more bandwidth. <laughs> please, Flo is not the best. Just leave Flo and go and join Digicel and, and the other service providers. The, the less people on Flo, the, the more bandwidth I have and the faster my speeds are. But I, I will still Flo. I've always had a uh, good experience with Flo. Very responsive and all of that. Now and then you have a problem, but you have problems with all of them. Anyway, uh, hey, look, Yusuf. <laughs> all right, um, now this question, let's focus. 
Now, this point and this point is in phase, not so. Whatever is happening at this point is also happening at this point, yes? Yes, sir. Yeah. Everybody clear with that idea, right? Now, yes, sir. they want the phase difference. They want the phase difference between this point and, and this point, A and B. But I'm saying this point C is representing A. Whatever A is doing, C is doing. C and A are twins. So if I want to find the difference between A and B in terms of the phase, it is identical to the difference between C and B. Do you understand that logic? Yes, can you repeat that, please? All right. So A and C, they are in phase. First point. Yes? Okay, understood, yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. So whatever is happening at A will also be happening at C. When A is at the crest, C is at the crest. When A is at the trough, C is at the trough. They're following each other. We're good. So A and C are identical. So C is like the twin of A. You okay with that? Yes, sir. All right, especially Jada. Jada, you okay with that? Yes, sir. All right. Now, they want us to find the difference between A and B, but since A and C are identical, we can use C as our representative and rarely find the phase difference between C and B because I'll be the same as A and B, given that B and, uh, A and C are twins. And therefore, the question comes down to using C as a proxy for A. And therefore, when we run the math, look at it, from here to here, same thing as before, from here to here is T over two. From here to here is T over four, so the total time difference between C and B, the total time difference between B and C is three over four T. Okay. And therefore, going back to the equation that delta theta over two pi is equal to T over T, this T is We good? Yes, sir. All right, so that is the other way. If you don't see the seven over two pi, you don't see the seven over two pi, this is the other way to do it. I will screenshot this because you understand why I couldn't do it um, over WhatsApp this morning. I had to explain it with those kinds of... Um, yes, sir, thank you. No problem. I'll put it in the general group chat so everybody can access it. Screenshots, right? All right, clear all drawings. Listen, if we have to do a little half an hour extra, we have to do a half an hour extra. We have to finish this paper today. All right, so you all have other classes to join immediately after. Yes. All right, so we're we finishing this paper today. This has to happen. It has to be finished today. Whatever discussion we have, it has to be finished today. Um, okay. Uh, number 20. Let's see. Uh, the pendulum starts its oscillation at position A, the kinetic energy of the pendulum as maximum, obviously, at B. Is Leo, you have a question, sir. What? Leo, you have a question. Leo does have a question. Um, can we have the same alternate? What's the question, Leo? I don't understand the question. Can we have what? 
Can we do the same having alternate B? Can we do the same having alternate B? What do you mean alternate B? I mean make B alternate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can have a B, Leo. In the last question, you can make B here. You follow? Because B, this B here, not, not this point here, this point and that point. You have to be careful at B though. I showed the class how to see which points are similar by shifting the wave front. So you be careful of that one. Keep this simple. I did it the simplest way I could, but you could choose B and, and replace B as being here, not here. There's a reason for that and I'm not gonna get into. And if you do that, you will still see the three quarter T. You okay with that, Leo? Yeah. All right, thanks, um, uh, Evelyn, for that um, heads up. Once I, I'm focused here, so if anybody posts a question or asks or in the waiting room, I would need you to help me by that. Uh, I'm focused on answering the questions as we go forward. All right, students hearing that, 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 what is the shortest wavelength of sound? Um, Let's see if I wrote up the answer to that, number 21. So you missed number 20, which was the one with the simple harmonic motion. You're real? Yeah. I did. Where number 21? Oh, you sure I missed that one, dog? I don't think I had finished, explain it. Okay, kinetic energy is maximum in the middle. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. 21. Answer that. A student's range of hearing is that. What is the shortest wavelength? Uh, lambda is equal to V over F. V is 330. And the frequency that... The, sh the shortest wavelength will have the, 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 the largest frequency. So the shortest wavelength, this will give us the shortest wavelength, the largest frequency. You can see it here, wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency. So the highest frequency will give us the shortest wavelength. So we have to put 15,000 in the denominator. And you should get this as your answer. Yes? Yes, sir. Uh, which of the following statements concerning sound and light waves is correct? Sound and light waves. We know that sound is a longitudinal, and we know that light waves is transverse. We know sound requires a medium. We know light does not require a medium. There are some differences. Both sound and light longitudinal rubbish. Both sound and light transverse equal rubbish. Sound waves in air are transverse. Oh, come on, get real. Okay, right? Next one, number 23. Um. Looking out my window in case anybody approaching my house, I'll deal with them. Um, number 23 refers to the following graph, which shows a stationary wave on a string. Where is, does an anti-node exist? An anti-node, we know when a wave and a stationary wave is set up, the anti-node is the point of maximum displacement. The opposite of anti-node is the node. The node is a point of zero displacement. The node is a point of zero displacement, meaning the node does not move. If this is a stationary wave, we will have nodes in all of these positions. All of these points will be nodes. We know also that an anti-node exists exactly midway 
The anti-node exists midway between nodes. We know that. So an anti-node will exist at this point. This point will experience maximum positive and maximum negative vibration. As would this point, it will experience it because it's midway between the two nodes, maximum, maximum positive and maximum negative vibration. So P and R would clearly be anti-nodes. Not S and clearly not Q either. We're good? Number 24, which uh, on what do the pitch and loudness of a sound depend? Pitch clearly depends on frequency and loudness depends on amplitude. Anybody in Form 5 can explain that to you. Number 25. In Young's double slit experiment, the separation between the slits is halved and all of that. So in Young's double slit experiment, we know that Y the separation between the fringes is lambda d over a. That's the general equation. In a Young's double set experiment, let's say now the experiment is repeated and the separation between the slits is halved. We're making this denominator, not all, no longer a, it becomes a divided by two. The separation is halved. And secondly, the distance between the slits and screen, that's D, the distance between the slits and the screen is doubled. So we bring it in. The question is what happens to Y? What is Y prime going to be? Y with this adjustment done. And we can do the math and we can see that it is four lambda D over A. So what happens is the separation between the fringes is quadrupled. The separation between the fringes is quadrupled, and the answer is D. Number 26, the answer is C. Why? Because polarization is the only property here that cannot happen. Polarization is where you confine the vibration. Polarization is where you confine Polarization is where you confine the wave vibration where you confine the wave vibration to one plane. That's called polarization. Polarization can only happen to transverse waves. All right, again, we have a lot of information on that. I passed around with the Polaroid film in class and we rotated the film and we saw what we saw with our watches and our calculators and all of that. So we have some experience. I'm just referencing this concept of polarization to know where we did it in lessons and in school. All right. So therefore the answer is C. Okay, number 27. Um, polarization is where you confine. I just wrote it here. Polarization. I don't know who's that. Who's that? Evelyn, you change up into Arabic. Yusuf, how are you going, boy? I did, sir. You are, you are calling me late, Yusuf. You are another class or what? You walk into my class. What kind of, what kind of hours are going with you? Um. You have a life. All right, cool.
that's what polarization is, where you confine the vibration to uh, one plane, Evelyn. Okay. All right. You weren't in class when we did the Polaroid film and we explained all that. We passed the film around and showed and you rotate the film on your, on, your, on your calculator. It got dark in one angle. Um, so class, so class was that? Oh, so I remember something with um, calculator. Right? Or wasn't that in unit two class? That was unit one. Exactly. Everybody in class knows what we're talking about. And anybody don't know what we're talking about? So, well, I wasn't there for a while in it. Well, that's the story. Um, so, read up on polarization. Uh, uh, it's a, it's, it's a, I'm not going to teach it now, but read up on it and, and check on it if you need more help. Yes. But that was module two. You was there for module two. Is module three you kind of skate out? Ah, uh, come on, there's a lag. All right, number 27. Again, I wrote up the answer to this already. Right. A lot of writing. Yes. So, at a distance of 20 meter, a loudspeaker's amplitude of that, and they want us to find the amplitude at 40 meter. What do we know about a loudspeaker? A loudspeaker is really a point source. A loudspeaker is producing sound in a small region. And that sound is spreading in all directions. So a loudspeaker behaves as if it was a point source. And if you have a point source, the intensity of the wave, if you have a point source, is given by that equation. Um, where's it? Hold on. Eh? Oh, come on. Sorry. I have all kind of windows open here. I just want to show you where I got the equation from. Keep. Unit one, module two, manual. And this would be the chapter on the chapter on intensity. Blah, 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 blah. Introduction to standing waves by intensity. Gosh, I had to scroll through the whole thing. Simple harmonic motion resonance. You have some introduction to wave. That's, oh, I can switch intensity. Sorry, people. I'm just trying to get this thing done as quickly as I can find intensity. Yep, let's go next. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. All right, we know several things. This is on page uh, 24. We know several things. One, if you have a parallel beam, the intensity of the beam does not change. Intensity is defined as power per unit cross-sectional area. Right? If you have a parallel beam, the intensity does not change. If you're here, it is as intense as if you're there. It's like a spotlight. The intensity is constant. But if you have a point source, if you have a point source, look at right here. For a point source, the intensity, and you can actually derive this, the intensity is the power divided by the surface area of a sphere because you're pretending as if this energy is being spread in a solid angle of 360 degrees. So the base idea for a point source for the loudspeaker's intensity is proportional to one over R squared. First idea. Second idea is another e expression we're supposed to know that the intensity of a wave is proportional to the amplitude squared. So these are the two points on which this question is based. So one, intensity is inversely proportional to R squared and intensity is proportional to A squared. Therefore, A squared must be proportional to one over R squared, or A is inversely proportional to R. And therefore, we can, when you can multiply A by R and say A R must be a constant, the amplitude by the radius or the distance from the source must be a constant. 
and therefore A, A1 over R1 is equal to A2 over R2. So for this 20 meters, A1 is 20. Sorry, R1 is 20 and A1 is 0 0.012. And A2 is 40. And we can solve the equation to get B as the answer. Questions? None. Number 28. A standing wave is produced in a 10 meter long stretch string. If the string vibrates in five segments, let's think what five segments could throw you off. Everybody here has seen what a standing wave looks like, right? Everybody has seen what a standing wave looks like. That's a segment. One, two, three, four segments. These are four segments here. That's a node. That's another node. This is an anti-node in between. This is just four segments. You see what the segments look like. Now, everybody saw that? Everybody clear on this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's yes, sir. a standing wave, right? I have drawn it like this, where they're talking about five of these segments. So that's one segment, two, three, four, five segments set up in the 10 meter long stretched string. And if you have five segments, then the length of one segment must be two meters, right? And we know the distance from node to node is half lambda. Everybody knows that, right? The distance from node to node is equal to lambda over 2. We all know that. This is a node here. That's another node there. In between here, there are anti-nodes, of course, but the distance between two nodes, that distance, is lambda over two. So if you look at this entire distance and you have one, two, three, four, five lambda over twos, and that is equal to 10 meter, when you run the math, you would get that lambda is equal to, which is what I have here. And if you have lambda is four meter, F is V over lambda, they gave us the velocity is 20. And therefore, we get questions. So can you just go over it again, please? Sure. You want to see the video or are you okay with the video? No, sir. I'm okay with the video. Right. So what they said was this 10 meters of the string that they have, 10 meters long, it's set up five segments. One, two, three, four, five segments. And each segment, the distance from one node to the other node, we know is half lambda. And therefore, this distance must be two meters. Are you okay with that point? Yes, sir. All right. If that is two meters, then lambda is the distance from here to here. And therefore, lambda must be four meters. You okay with that point? Yes, sir. And we know that F, we know the equation V is equal to F lambda. We know that V is equal to F lambda. So therefore, if you transpose F, make F the subject, F is going to be V over lambda. And they gave us V is 20. And we figured out lambda to be 4. So we get that the answer is C. That's good now. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Number 29. Colors are seen when the sun is shining on a soap bubble. This phenomenon is because of interference. When, light dif when white light interferes with each other, it creates destructive and constructive interference where you actually see the colors of the spectrum. 
so colors are seen when the sun is shining on a soap bubble the phenomenon is because of interference of of light so it could be that was like a mistake that was a you typed that wrong or sorry could be you typed that wrong that should i be some now so that's correct yeah, yes. I don't know if it could be diffraction. Yeah, I thought it would be diffraction, but it's a detraction now. Well, it could, if, even if it's diffraction, it could be wrong. So. Okay. There's no diffraction. I hope I didn't type it right. I'll, I'll double check that. That's a good point. I'll double check that. But even if it's diffraction, it'll be incorrect. Number 30. Um... The near point. Okay, so we spoke about this question last day and, I, and we worked it out last day. Um, I put both solutions this time. I alluded to a shortcut, a so called shortcut solution that people um, use. Uh, if it would stop moving. All right, cool. All right, take a look at this while I go and get uh, something to drink. My throat feels uh, very dry. Just give me um, 30 seconds. Go, take a look at this. Okay, I'm back. Sir, All right. I don't understand what you did. Seriously? Well, I, could, oh. I could follow, like, I understand you say we get the 53 and not. Wait, so we get the 0 0.02 from. All right, so good question. When we're dealing with the eye, um, when we're dealing with the eye, uh, if I could draw, I'm not very good at drawing, uh, so. Trying to draw an eye. Ah. Uh, huh. Just draw a circle, sir. Just draw a circle. No, I have to draw it like this. Ah. One more time. Last chance. Last chance. Okay, that's it. That's your eye, right? This is your retina. This is where the image is formed, not so. Yes, sir. And the image distance is the distance. Uh, let's go in title. The image distance with the eye is the distance from here to here. That's called your image distance V. Now that image distance V in the normal adult 
is 17 millimeters. But a normal adult, that distance from, the, from your cornea to the retina is about 17 millimeters or 1.7 centimeters. And in doing the math here, this of course is your V, right? In doing the math on, in this calculation, we approximate it to be 20 millimeters. And when we convert 20 millimeters to meter, we get 100. So when we're running any I calculation, once we're looking for V, we replace V by, which is why I put this number here. Okay, so on this. Yeah. So what the word is? So yeah, um, yeah, right, probably what this word is underneath red. Image. Oh. Right, sir, and where I got the um fifty-four, the fifty-four, right? I can yeah. show I have that right here. Yeah, but then why am subtract? This is where I have the 54. This is how you get the 54. For the normal eye, right? This 54 mm -hmm. is for the normal eye. 54 diopters is the power of what we call the normal person. 54 what? Diopters. Diopters. It's what we call the normal person, right? Now, what is the normal person? The normal person is a person who can have a near point of 25 centimeters meaning that a normal person can read something that is 25 centimeters from their eyes. Tell me if you're okay with that. Is Jada was talking to? I'm not sure. I think it is Jada. Yes, sir. I understand. All right. So when you put this, uh -huh. this um, when you put the, you, you're working the same equation, Jada. Mm -hmm. The same equation here. Yeah. You already know this is always going to be 0 0.02. But for the normal person, U is going to be 0 0.25, 25 centimeters. So okay. the normal person, the normal power for the normal person is 54 diopters. This is our magic number. There are two magic numbers. For the near point, it's 54 diopters. And for the far point, it's 50 diopters. Okay. Far point. The power is equal to 50 diopters. And then we can always show you how that happens, but not right now. You can check in the notes, you'll see it. It's all laid out. Right, no problem. All right. right, for the near point. So this is the normal power. So when, when somebody has an eye defect, like this person has an eye defect, why does she have a defect? Because she cannot read 25 centimeters from her eye. She can only read 30 centimeters. So her power, the power of her eye is 53 and a third diopters. How do we get her eye to be 54 diopters? We have to use our glasses. And the power of the glasses to make her eyes 54 is you have to add 2.2 2 thirds diopters. I understand, sir. Thank you. Right? So this is the extra power needed to fix her vision. The extra power needed to fix her vision is 2 thirds diopters. And once you know the power needed, you can use the same equation to get the focal length of the lens needed to fix the vision. Clear? And the answer is D. And I know I've seen people, when I ask people to work this question, they just put numbers together like this and give me an answer and say, that's the answer. I'm showing you why that is the answer, how you can get that. I don't want you to do this because a lot of people don't understand what on earth they're doing when they put these numbers together. This is the reason here why you would do 1 over 0.25 minus 1 over 30. This is the reason for it. But this is exactly what I'm doing here as well. Okay? So this is a shortcut that has a lot of people don't understand why they're doing it. They, do, they just don't understand. They just know that just do this and you get the answer. But this, if you look at the math here, you see the reason why you would do it and how you would get the answer. So that's just another way of doing the same thing. But it's the same thing you're doing in, in, in the complete theory as it goes. All right, so we got any other questions on this? On this? No. Number 31, into module three now. 
that's okay. I'm going to skip past this fast. I'm going to waste time on this. Everybody knows how to convert from Celsius to Kelvin. Yeah. Which of the following? Which of the following thermometers measures temperatures of 73 Kelvin and 1473? Um, why not this though? Why this wouldn't work? Oxygen is likely to combust. Oxygen is a very dangerous gas. You wouldn't want to take it to high temperatures. It will combust. Very reactive okay. temperatures. All right. Um, blah, blah, blah. Again, this one is pretty basic. This is the answer I've written up already. This we have to know the defining equation for the centigrade scale. And once you know the defining equation for the centigrade scale, you have to substitute these three values and then solve. So it's pretty straightforward. You want me to hold this here for a second? Or are you okay with this? Yes, I hold it there for a second. Sure. So this is an equation you have to do. This is called the defining equation for the centigrade scale. Tell to release. I understand it. Go ahead. Um, you all want to do a test on Wednesday or we continue with teaching like this? Or you want to do another paper like this? Or Cambridge another, paper like this? Oh, God, no Cambridge, sir. No, no, no. Hey, you had to face Cambridge. Yeah. But, that test, sir. Uh, I'm okay with the test. No. I rather oh. teach in. Please I teach rather in. teach in. Please I, I just, teach I just, in. I just said I'm okay with don't, don't beat okay, up. Okay, I'm wasting. Are we okay with? Don't beat up. Don't beat up. Don't beat up. If you want another session like this, we'll have another session just like this. Yes, sir. The test can happen anytime. I can uh, send a test and you can send your answers. That can happen. And if people want to do the test, some people losing confidence and getting stressed out with the scores and so on. Um, mm -hmm. But Jada, you have to do Cambridge. Once you get the keep under control, you have to do Cambridge. You don't want to just prepare for the... Um, for the keep and expect different questions to come and you'll throw you completely off. So okay, we're doing okay. the keep. We're doing the keep. All. You'll be masters of the keep. But I want you to be able to do the Cambridge and be surprised by questions and be able to respond in an exam setting with that kind of stress. Okay, and then, okay. I've, then I've trained you for the exam. So I know a lot of people putting all their eggs in one basket saying, okay, they only bring in repeat questions. And I, it may happen. Um, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a crystal ball. But if I have to prepare my students, I'll prepare you for all scenarios and not just for a limited possibility of scenarios. Okay? Um, all right. I don't want to know that they change up. I don't want to know that the reason why the government accepted only a paper one is if CXC told them, listen, we're changing up all the questions. I don't know if that was an agreement that they came so they could differentiate between people. I don't know if that's an agreement. That's why the ministry, I don't know what was done. I have to think that way. I have to train my students to think that way, to face new questions so that when they're in the exam, they could think physics and not think memorizing an answer. Those who memorize answer, if those questions do come, they're in real, real Canada. They're going to be real trouble. So we're going to prepare for all eventualities. So don't run from it. I know some of you will duck questions, duck sessions when we have Cambridge coming. You don't want to do the Cambridge test because that's up to you. Eh? But um, I don't like to play with fire. I like to prepare. SI unit of heat capacity, easy. All right, heat capacity is the heat required to cause the, defined, the definition of heat capacity is the heat required. Energy, the heat energy. Is the heat required to produce unit temperature change? 
heat capacity C is equal to the heat energy required to cause unit temperature change. That's a defining equation, and therefore the, the units will be the joule per Kelvin. Good. Next one, basic again. That's pretty straightforward. Number 36, I already wrote up the solution here. Basically, the water is falling from a height of 500 meters. And if the water is falling from that height, the water has potential energy at the top. As it falls, the water converts that potential energy to kinetic, but when it hits the pool of water at the bottom, the water gets churned up and it converts that kinetic. It converts that kinetic to heat energy. So the water is supposed to be slightly hotter here because the loss in potential energy becomes equal to essentially the gain in heat energy. So we can write this in the form of an expression, loss in potential energy is MGH, gain in heat energy is MC delta theta. And therefore we can solve and we're good to go. Questions? None. 37. Metals are generally better conductors than non-metals because, of course, metals have free electrons. No rocket science there. Uh, again, we did this the other day. Um, there was a basic premise that we keep saying. I, I, I put the answer in more detail here, where if you have a hot end and a cold end, you would have a, a transmission of heat across. Heat will be flowing across. And the heat, even though this is a better conductor than this, they told us that, that uh, uh, thermal conductivity is, of A is greater than B. A is a better conductor. Even though this is a better conductor than this, even though there's a better conductor, when thermal equilibrium is established, the rate of flow of heat through A is exactly equal to the rate of flow of heat through B. Let me write that down. So can you repeat what you said? I'm going to write it. I'm going to write it. Okay. Right? This is what I was saying. That when, can you read this? Is it too fine? So a different color, right? Yep. You will put a different color? The red is not working for you? Okay, good now, I guess, yeah. I could take, change the color, you know, it's right there. Black. So make it blue. Make it blue? Much better. All right. 
What I said was, when thermal equilibrium is established in a conducting medium, when you set up thermal equilibrium, when it's called, thermal equilibrium is also called steady state, all right? And it's only in thermal equilibrium or in steady state do we do calculations of heat transfer. If steady state is not reached, you can't apply any of the equations that we know for heat transfer. So when thermal equilibrium is established in a conducting medium, the first point I want you to know is the temperature at all points reach a constant value, meaning that when thermal equilibrium is established here, remember heat is flowing from the hot end to the cold end. You see at this point, the temperature at that point reaches a constant value, it does not change. The temperature at this point reaches a different constant value and it does not change. Does that make sense? That's what equilibrium means. First point, everybody okay with that? Yes, sir. Now, there is a consequence. If, look at the point, look at this logic here now. If the temperature, uh, let me get another color, I'll use the blue. If the temperature at this point is not changing, what does it mean about the heat flowing to that point and the heat flowing from that point? What does it mean? It means that the amount of heat arriving here must be exactly equal to the amount of heat leaving. That's the only way the temperature can remain constant. Jada, talk to me. Um, sorry, I can say it over, please. Sure. The, I want to make the first point clear. When thermal equilibrium is set up, the temperature of this point reaches a steady value. Right. You, you okay with that? How yeah. can the temperature here reach a steady value? The only way this can reach a steady value, but heat is flowing. Heat is still flowing. Here is hot, here is cold. Heat will be flowing down the system. Are you okay with the second point? Okay, all right, yeah. And the only way this could reach a steady value is the amount of heat arriving here must be exactly equal to the amount of heat leaving. Anytime you keep, you add heat to this point, the temperature will rise. Anytime so can we um, think of it as a, um, if you have a hot bowl or something and it puts in water, the um, heat that leaving the bowl is this heat that the water will be gaining. Uh, the hot bowl and water is not good. Um, is not a good example. Because the hot bowl is immersed in the water. Mm -hmm. When this hot bowl reaches 100, no more heat arrives here. All the heat that is supplied here produces vapor. So it's not like a system where you have series conduction. Okay, sir. All right. So this is a system where it's like, it's like, okay, the, the analogy here is like water flowing down a, a stream. That's the analogy here that we could use. Water flowing down a stream. The water level here remains constant because the amount, the mass of water flowing to that point is exactly equal to the mass of water leaving that point. So it doesn't rise nor fall. It remains constant. This is the riverbed and the water is flowing. That will help you. Understood, sir. I think so. <laughs> All right. But, um, but the, the basic point is in, in order for temperature to, 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 to rise, you must have more heat arriving than leaving. In order for temperature to fall, you must have more heat leaving than is arriving. And if the temperature is constant, it means the amount of heat arriving is exactly equal to the amount of heat being taken away. So there's no buildup of heat and, there, and that's why there's no rise in temperature. I mean, that can, we can explain it many different ways. So this is our system, all right? And we want, we want to find which graph represents the variation with temperature and distance. Now, we know the first thing we know is the amount of heat flowing through this piece of material A is given by Ka 
delta theta here, I'm calling the temperature difference from here to here. I'm calling that temperature difference delta theta E. And I'm calling the temperature difference from here to here delta theta B. That's the temperature difference across here. This is element B. And we know the conductivity equation that says that Q over T is equal to K A is area into delta theta over T. This is the conductivity equation. I'm writing the conductivity equation for A. This is the conductivity equation for A where I call this L. It's one centimeter, but I'm gonna call it L in general. This is also L. So I can write the equation for A. I can write the equation for B. And we know that the heat transfer through A is exactly equal to the rate of heat transfer through B. And I can, trans I can cancel what can cancel, I can end up with this. This is the equation here. It says that Ka over Kb, when you, when you cross multiply, Ka over Kb is equal to delta theta B, this goes in a denominator here, over delta theta A. And we know that Ka, they told us that Ka is greater than the thermal conductivity of A is greater than the thermal conductivity of B. And therefore, if Ka is bigger than Kb, then the temperature change across B must be greater than the temperature change across A. And therefore, the answer has to be this, where there is a bigger temperature change across B than there is across E. I also made another point here. When it's well lagged, once you use the word well lagged, the lines are straight. This cannot happen. This cannot happen if it's well lagged. This cannot happen if it's well lagged. We good? There's a when I taught taught you, I or I also said it. Uh, there's a short way I taught it, which is there's going to be a bigger temperature gradient across the poor conductor. That's the other way I was teaching you. There's always going to be a larger temperature gradient. There's always going to be a larger temperature gradient across the poor or worse conductor. Always going to be a larger temperature gradient across the poor or worse conductor. All right, because you need a greater push to move the heat through, so you have a bigger gradient. It's going to be a bigger gradient, a bigger slope for the poor conductor and a small slope for the good conductor. Because the heat flows easily here, so you don't need much of a temperature push to get the heat across. But in, the, in B, where it's not as a good a conductor as A, you need a bigger push, a bigger slope, a bigger gradient for that heat to flow across. That is the intuitive way of um, picking up mean fact. Number 39. Pretty straightforward. Convection is a consequence of density change. So, could you copy that? Sure. Thanks. All right, number 40. I'm not going to work. I'll take it 
to, I want to, I want you to try number 40 and verify the answer is C. I was kind of putting down the answers here, but let me just take this off. That's take this off, right? The answer for number 40 is C. I'm going to give you a chance to work that. If you need me to work it out, I will do so at another time. Not right now. Number four, I just want to finish up this paper. Number 41, the answer is, well, I kind of worked this out for you. Answer is A. And here we go. We have a pool and they're telling us it's 20 meter deep. But they're also telling us that 10 meter represents atmosphere. So although here's 20 meters deep, Although this is 20 meters deep, the pressure that it represents is 2 PA. All right? The pressure difference from the base to the top is 2 PA, but we also have to remember atmospheric pressure, 1 PA is pressing down on, on top of the water. So to talk about the pressure of this bubble, we have 2 PA due to the water, and on top of that, we have one PA due to the atmosphere. So the total pressure on the bubble down here is three PA. Everybody understands that first point? Anybody need clarification on that? Um, so you can just re-explain how you get two PA. All right. They told us that the, 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 the lake is 20 meters deep, right? So that's the depth of the lake. And what they also tell us is water depth of 10 meters exerts a pressure equal to atmospheric pressure. So this depth, 20 meter, can be replaced as a pressure as 2 PA. And if you have atmospheric pressure pressing down on the water surface, and the water is also pressing down, the total force or pressure that this bubble will experience is 2 PA plus 1 PA or 3 PA. You okay with that? Yes, sir. It's like having your hand here. If you put your hand here and you place a book on top of your hand, the book might be pressing down on your hand. That's not a problem. That'll produce some pain. No problem. It's not too bad. But if you have somebody standing up on top of the book, wouldn't their weight also be acting on you? And that's exactly what's happening here. The atmospheric pressure is pressing down on the water and the water is pressing down on the bubble. So the total pressure would be 3 PA. When the bubble reaches the surface, there's no water pressing down. So the pressure on that water on the top is 1 PA. All right, so we have the pressure here, PA, pressure here, 3 PA. And they've given us the volume of the bubble at the surface. So let's call this P1, V1. Let's call this P2, V2. We know that P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2, which is known as Boyle's Law. And we, we need to find V1. We need to find the volume. Sorry, we need to find V2. Okay. I misnamed it, which means I'll have to fix it. Oh, sorry. We need to find what? Oh, sorry. I did not misname it. We need to find V1. We need to find the volume underwater. What is the volume of the bubble at the bottom of the lake? So I make V1 the subject of the equation and I substitute the pressures that I have. P2 is PA. P1 is 3PA and I solve. No problems. Questions going once, twice. Number, oh, this one is pretty basic. All right. Young's modulus is defined to be tensile stress over tensile strain. All right. We know tensile stress is force per unit cross-sectional area and strain is extension over original length. And when you juggle things around, you end up with this, which is E. Straightforward. From the definition of Young's modulus and what stress and strain is. Number 43. 
Um, in this question, we were given the density, you see, and there's one equation for pressure, how it relates to density, that P is equal to one third the rho C squared. Do you all know this equation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anybody wants to see where that equation comes from? Yes, sir. Sure. Everybody knows this form of the equation, PV. Sorry. That PV is equal to one third N and A M C squared. Everybody knows this? Well, yes, not, you have to know this is a fact that you have to know, right? Now, what is NNA? NNA, the number of moles by Avogadro's number, the product of N and NA, is really the number of molecules N. This is the number of molecules in the gas. And if you multiply the number of molecules in the gas, and this is the mass of each molecule, if you multiply the number of molecules in the gas by the mass of each molecule, it will give you the total mass of the gas. M is the total mass of the gas. And of course, the C is called the mean square speed, mean square, as PV. If I bring V in the denominator, then P is equal to one third M over V by C squared. M over V, we know that is density. So we get P is equal to one third rho C squared. Now, in this question, we were given rho, we were given P, and we were asked to find the RMS. What is the RMS? This, is, this here is called the mean square speed. This is called the mean square speed. This is called the RMS. Isaiah in the waiting room, sorry. Sorry, okay, I didn't realize that. This is called the RMS speed. The RMS speed is this really the square root of this mean square. So if you get the mean square, you just find the square root and you're good to go. And uh, number 44. Uh, take a look at that. You're, you're okay with number 44. I just want to find the manual on, on what? Elasticity, deformation of solid, page 56. Gosh. All right, when we did springs, we said that when you had combining elastic material like springs, and when you have two springs in parallel, where is it? Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, when you have two springs in parts right here, uh, we had this, we done this in class, right? When you have two springs in parallel, the force constant of two springs in parallel is 2K, where K is the force constant of one of those springs. You all remember this? Yes or no? No cider. Sure. I will develop it. Again, 
but the question can I shift power to this though? I don't think she really. I think so, yeah, I find so. Okay, well, um this is what you're supposed to know here that when you have two springs in parallel, whatever that force constant is, the force constant of one spring is half of that. So it's not, I mean, if you can, you can make the association and consider it to be straightforward because it's one half, but it's not that straightforward really when you think about it. Okay. Um, so let me just develop the, the concept of that equation. If we have a spring of force constant k and another spring in parallel of force constant k. What do I mean by force constant k with that spring? If I put a force f on it, it causes an extension of E. So that force constant K that we're talking about, that single spring is really F force over extension. That's what K is. Now, when I have two springs in parallel, if I were to place the same load F here, how much would this spring extend? And we had analyzed that this spring would not extend the distance E. This spring will extend the distance of E over two. So the force constant of this combination of spring, Kp as I will call it, is equal to force over extension, which is, which is, K is F over E, which is equal to 2K. You see, they can bring a question like this where they have two springs in series. And if I have two springs in series and I put the same load F on it, how much would this spring extend? How much would this combination of two springs, how much would it stretch by? Anybody, how much would it stretch by if I had them one on top of the other like this? If I put the same load F as I did here and here on these two springs, how much would it stretch by? Each of these springs have a force constant K. How much would it stretch by? Two K, sir. That's right. Not two K, but two E. Do you agree with this? Anybody disagrees with this? You want clarification? So we good. And therefore the force constant Kp, Ks, sorry, is equal to force over extension. The extension in this case is 2e. And therefore it is a half F over E which Ks is going to be a half K. So the force constant of these springs in series is a half K and the force constant of the same springs when they put in parallel is 2K. These are two equations. We, these are two configurations we are supposed to know. We did in class. We have these, I, I'm had you draw these diagrams and do all of these things to get this concept clear. All right, that's done. So can take a picture. Awesome. Yeah, go. Mm -hmm. And the final question, number 45. We know that the area under the graph represents the strain energy or the energy stored in the wire when stretching is taking place or the work done, all right? So when you stretch up to one millimeter extension, this area would represent how much work was, was done in stretching. Work is force, is a half force by extension, a half Fe. That'll be this area here. 
If you therefore stretched it up to two millimeters, this entire triangle represents the total work done in stretching it for two. But the question is how much work is done in stretching it from one to two? And that will be the shaded area. The shaded area represents the amount of work done in stretching it from one millimeter to two millimeter. And therefore, we can find the area. I did it here two different ways. You find the area of one triangle and take this area away from the area of the big triangle. It's right here. And we can get the answer, or you can simplify the area of this trapezium, which is what I did here. They'll both give you the same answer of 0 0.045. We're good? Yes, sir.